Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I think it's something interesting that folks in the mountains like to go down to the beach and people at the beach like to go to the mountains. <laughs> so, maybe we can meet in the middle sometime. I tell you what, I've been so encouraged by being here up in Simpsonville and in Greenville. I tell you, it's something that I've never seen before because I'm, I'm in the country and I don't get out of the country too much. Like I mentioned to some of you before, Harleyville has about 600 people in it all together. We had a caution light at one time, but they took it down because we weren't using it enough. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> we came up and we went to uh, we went to Chick-fil-A. We usually stop off by Chick-fil-A, grab a bite to eat before we come over because I start the trip early because I never know if there's going to be traffic in Columbia. So we got there a little bit before 6 o'clock, and there... I don't know if you've seen it or not, you probably have, this is probably old news, but it's exciting to me that there are automatic trash cans at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and I had never seen one before, and there is a green light on the front, and it has ready on it. And I said, you know, I'm going to master this thing. I don't, I don't know exactly how it works, but I was in front of that trash can waving my hand in front of that green dot. <laughs> And, you know, I'm trying to use the force on it and all like that. It, it didn't, it did nothing at all. So I went ahead and I sat down and I was looking at other people and they were doing the exact same thing that I was. And they were just standing there. Every now and then someone would figure it out. And one of the waitresses came by and asked me if I was okay. And I said, you've got to explain this thing to me. And so she explained it to me. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these people figure out this trash can and these little kids come over. I mean, they're like three, four, maybe five years old, and they're figuring out this trash can. There was one kid that was there that was so excited, you would have thought that it was Christmas morning. <laughs> he was so excited. So if you want some cheap entertainment around your park, just go over to Chick-fil-A, get you an ice cream cone, and just sit back and look at the trash can, because it is hilarious. So anyway, y'all didn't get me up here for this. You're looking at a series, you're going through the Old Testament. And so as I was thinking about what to speak upon, I wanted to look at something that was more than just simply a glimpse in time about certain people. Even though it is, in a way, I want us to look a little bit deeper, and I want us to look at the concept of partial obedience. The concept of partial obedience. And I think that we can see it very easily when we're looking at Saul and when we're looking at Samuel. I want us to begin this way. Here's a good illustration for you. You've got teens in your house and you yourself, you've got things that you need to do. You're going to be out of the house for about an hour. You go over to your teen and you say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fold the laundry and put it away. Simple, isn't it? Just go over to the dryer. Some might say it's not that simple. You don't have a chance. Actually, I do. <laughs> but, but I want you to go. I want you to get these clothes. I want you to fold them, put them away, and I want you to wash clothes. No problem, they say. And so you leave the house, and you go and you do your chores. You come back after about an hour, and they said, you know, I've, I've done it. Everything you asked me to do is done. It. But you look in the sink, and they're dirty dishes. And you look at them kind of curiously, and you say... I, I thought I asked you to do these things. And they said, well, I did. You know, I, I got the laundry, I folded it up, put it away. And you said, well, what about the dishes? And you said, well, I, I didn't worry about that. I figured you'd be all right if I just folded the clothes and put them away. 
Now, is that obedience? No. No. I mean, a, a part of it, there, there's a little bit there, but the other part is not there. And they're sitting on back on the couch, and they're they're playing their games on their phones and chewing gum. What I've done, what I've asked you to do. No, no, no not really. Only part of it. See, that's partial obedience. Sometimes when we will reason like this, that it really doesn't matter what I do in worship as long as I'm worshiping. Don't bother me with the details. I know what worship is about. I'm worshiping, but it doesn't really matter what I do because God will accept anything in which I give Him because He's a gracious and loving God. Sometimes we reason like that. Maybe we reason like it doesn't really matter what I do to be saved as long as I'm sincere. When if you step outside of these walls, that's the mindset of the world. It doesn't really matter what I do in order to be saved, but God, God knows my heart. He understands the sincerity of my heart, and so therefore, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and, and, and if everything's okay, and we will consider that obedience. Some will reason it really doesn't matter how I live as long as I love God. And everyone would say, or most Everyone will say, if you stop them on the aisles of Walmart, do you, do you have a relationship with God? Oh, yeah, 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 I do. Do you love the Lord? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I do. We're, we're just like two peas in a pod. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. But we're just like two peas in a pod. It doesn't really matter how I live. God knows my heart. But you see, that's partial obedience. That is, I'm really not concerned about what God wants but I'm going to offer up something. God really doesn't care about the details. Even though he gave us 66 books to help us with the details and show us his character and, and to show us how to live and to show us how to worship and to show us how to be saved, yet, you know what? It, it really doesn't matter, at least in our mind. But you know what? It matters in God's mind. I want us to go back and I want us to look at the situation with Saul and the Amalekites and the command that was given to him in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1 through 3. Some of you might be reading it from your Bibles. I'll give you an opportunity to get over there. If not, it's right there in front of you. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 1 through 3. And it says, And Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Listen to the words of the Lord. Just like that young man should have listened to his parents, right? Here is Saul, he, and here's the command. Listen to the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way whenever he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And we as Christians, we sit back and many folks will be aghast at that. What do you mean, God? Utterly destroy everything. A lot of people will be rather judgmental because they don't know the rest of the story. But here's the command to Saul, who is king over Israel, that I want you to go and I want you to utterly destroy them. Now, we always have to go back and look at the context of things. And what we would have to do is go back to Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 and following, and we see Amalek as they are coming out against Israel. And a lot of things that we really wouldn't understand unless we looked at this context to help us understand the command. But in verses 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 25, Deuteronomy 25 and verse 17, notice what is said here concerning this situation between Israel and the Amalekites. It says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. Remember the children of Israel have just crossed over the Red Sea, on dry land, and they come out the other side, that they are rejoicing because of this great deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And not too far down the road, there's the Amalekites. And it says, how he met you on the way and attacked your, notice this, he attacked your rear flank. 
all the stragglers at your rear whenever you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. How merciful were the Amalekites? They didn't gather their army together and have army against army. What they did was to go after the softest part of the children of Israel. And he says, they attacked your rear. The stronger ones would have been up front. The weaker ones would have been at the very back. And he says, notice this again, and they were tired. And they were weary. And they were not ready for battle. But you did not care. You attack them. And notice what 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 33 says. Your sword made women childless. You had no mercy whatsoever and you slaughtered them. Whenever there was no one there to protect them, you came down upon them and you destroyed them. And notice that again, and he did not fear God. And so that's why we have the command here, again, to utterly destroy them. Because that is what they have done to the children of Israel. Now, when we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and begin in verse 7, it says, and Saul attacked the Amalekites. Notice what it says, but Saul and the people... I'm one of those preachers that believes that every word is important. I believe that we should not look over any word, even all the <laughs> A's, the ands, the these that are there, the buts and the therefores. All of that is very, very important. But notice what it says here. But Saul and the people. Now, in a little bit, you're going to hear a lot about the people, the people, the people. But here it says, Saul and the people. And it says that they spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Notice what they're, what they're doing. That they are unwilling to utterly destroy them. Would it be safe to say, if I interjected this idea in here, that they were unwilling to to utterly obey the will of God. That they were unwilling to obey the command of God. And that's basically what we're bringing out here. But it says that they were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So if it looked good, they kept it. But if it didn't look that good, they destroyed it. Is that the command of God? Is the command of God to say, hey, if things look good, you go ahead and keep it, but if things look bad, you go ahead and destroy it? That wasn't the command of God, was it? It says everything needs to be destroyed because these people do not fear God. They are an abominable people, and they will always be a thorn in your side. And verse 11 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me. The phrase, and he turned back from following him, implies that at one time that he followed the Lord. That he was obedient to the Lord. He understood God's commands and he followed it. But now here we get in a situation where Saul and the people understand the will of God, but notice that he has turned back from following me. He has turned back from obeying me and has not performed my commandments, and it grieved Saul, Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. When we do not obey the Lord, come back to the 21st century, come back to the here and now, right where we're at. Whenever we do not obey the Lord it brings grief. This is it did during the time of Saul and Samuel. Whenever we partially obey the Lord, it brings grief. Keep that in mind. It, it works the same way now as it did back then. And people say, well, you know what? I'm offering something up to the Lord. I'm worshiping. 
maybe the way that I want to, but I'm worshiping. Isn't that enough? It always grieves the Lord whenever we do not fulfill His commands. When we hear the commands of God and we follow it, what do we call that? We call that walking by faith, right? We were people who walked by faith and not by sight, right? Amen. Here is Saul who is not walking by faith in God. Notice in verse 13 that it says in chapter 15, it says that Saul said, or Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really? Really? I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I have done it. I have done all in which God has told me to do. True or false? False. Notice verse 14. But. That but there shows a contrast in ideas. I have performed everything that God has asked me to do. But Samuel says... What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Oh, be careful that your sins find you out. What is this I hear? The bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen. I thought that the Lord had commanded you to destroy everything. Well, I, com I obeyed the command of the Lord. Oh no, oh no. Look at verse 15. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for, notice this, for the people. Well, we go back a few verses and it says Saul and the people. But now Saul has a spotlight aimed right at him. And he's, whoa, okay, wait a second. Are you accusing me of something? And Saul says, for the people, it's, it's not me. It's them. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest they have utterly destroyed. It wasn't me. It was them. How many people do you believe that on the day of judgment will use that exact same excuse? Well, you know, it was them. It, it, it was those, I, I was just kind of following along. You know, I really knew better, but I was just kind of following along. And yeah, this, you know, it's, it's them, not me. And you see how they're, he's trying to separate himself from them. But remember who Saul is. Saul is the king. Saul is the leader. And every eye is upon him. That's not a good excuse, is it? I want us to consider verse 16. Then Saul, Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. In verse 17 it says, so Samuel said, Whenever you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? What does that mean? Little in your own eyes. It's that idea of humility. Whenever you were humble, whenever you were humble and you were the head of, of Israel and, and the Lord invested Himself in you to choose you, a man who is head and shoulders above everyone else, and the Lord chose you. Whenever you were hiding amongst the armor, and the Lord picked you out. Why? Because you were humble when you followed the Lord. But now that you've become king, something has changed. Notice it says, And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission. Underline that word you. He sent who on a mission? The children of Israel? It doesn't say that. He sent you on a mission. He invested in you the command to conquer the Amalekites. Notice again as we go on. Further, and it says, and said, go and utterly destroy the what? The good guys? No. Destroy the sinners. And we need to understand who we are dealing with here. We are dealing with people who would take their children and offer them up in the fire to Molech. 
We are looking at people who would sacrifice to the asterisks and to the teraphim and to the gods of the land. And God is saying to them that you needed to go and utterly destroy them because if not, then you're going to adopt their ways. And later on, that is exactly what we see the children of Israel doing, adopting their ways and the abominable things by which these people had done. The children of Israel said, bring it on, let's go do it. But notice as we go a little bit further, he says, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? That's two times, isn't it? Two times in which the word you is used. Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? You're the leader. People are following you. They're going to do whatever you do. Because they look up to you. And notice how Saul doesn't get away with that. The people did this. It's not going to float with God. He says, you, I commanded you. Notice in verse 20 we go on and it says, And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And gone on the mission on which the Lord has sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Do you see the fallacy in that? I've destroyed them. Oh, but by the way, here's the king. Really? No. You see, that's partial obedience. We go on to say, but the people, but the people, do you hear it echoing? But the people took of the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things which had been utterly destroyed or should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. The reason why we did this, or the reason why the people did this, is because we were going to go do something good. We were going to, to take these sheep, we were going to take these oxen, and we were going to go to Gilgal, and we were going to sacrifice to the Lord. Really? Now think about this. We disobey you because we were going to do something good. We were going to take these things and sacrifice to you. How many times do we partially obey God because we have this wonderful idea? I may, it may not fit right in God's plan or anything, but let's twist things, let's tweak things just a, a little bit, and, you know, we might not be able to find any authority for it in the Bible, but let's go ahead and, and do it anyway. Is that obeying or not obeying? We're going to worship. Now, we're going to worship the way that we want to. And how many people in the world are worshiping the way that they want to? And some folks that might say, well, as long as they're worshiping, that's okay. God should be happy with it. Was God happy with this type of worship? Certainly not. He wouldn't have been happy with this worship. Why? Because I commanded you to take them all away. To wipe them away. We need to be careful as far as Christians today that we completely obey the Lord. That we are a people that go back to book and chapter and verse for our source of authority. That we are truly people of the book. Because whenever we start twisting God's word and once we get outside of the covers of these book, of this book, we're going to be in trouble. This as Saul was getting in trouble as he is going outside of the commandments of God. Notice in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. We're going right on down the list. And notice what it says. And Samuel said, and Samuel said, here are the words of the Lord. And Samuel said, Samuel, God's prophet, said this. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. You're going to take those sheep and you're going to take those oxen and you're going to go up to Gilgal and you are going to sacrifice them. But you know what? God's not going to be there. God's not going to hear you. He's not going to hear your worship. Why? Because you're disobedient. 
you knew what the Lord said and you refused to do it and you decided to worship God on your grounds and not God's grounds. He said you could worship or you could go and slaughter everything that you want to. You could go offer these things up to me, but I, I'm not going to listen to you. But I tell you what God will listen to is a heart that is obedient to him. Notice as well, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Notice this idea of to obey and that idea of to heed. And the word heed means to obey. But let's look at the other side of the coin. Notice that it says in verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and such stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. Notice this idea of obeying. And then also the contrast of rebellion and stubbornness. Are you a stubborn person? But most folks say it depends on what context you're talking about. <laughs> Whenever it comes to the Word of God, <clears throat> will we consider ourselves to be stubborn people? Again, when we say, I want to do it my way, that's stubbornness. Any of you who have children, and I might be telling on myself, understand what stubbornness is. And I'm convinced that there's no difference between children and adults except for age. We just do it more tactfully. We don't fall down in the aisles of food lion and thrash around. <laughs> we just do it in other ways. But whenever it comes to worship, whenever it comes to worship, we need to have the mindset of Jesus Christ. You remember whenever Jesus Christ is out in the garden, in the last few moments of his freedom. And he looks up to heaven and he said, Lord, let this cup pass for me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. We need to have the exact same mindset whenever it comes to anything and everything in, my, in our lives is, Lord, not our will, but your will be done. Amen. And whenever we begin to look at ourselves and say, well, you know what, but I don't want to do it this way. What is that? That stubbornness. And notice at the very end that God has rejected you. And whenever we have an air of stubbornness about us, whenever it comes to the commands of God and how we are worshiping and coming to God's word, and, you know what? I see what it says. But that's dangerous. But is one of the most dangerous words in the Bible. Notice he will reject us as well. He will reject us as well. If he will reject Saul being king, he will reject us as well. Notice verse 24. Verse 24 said, And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the command of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And verse 25 says, Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. How many people partially obey the word of the Lord because they are afraid of what other people might think? Well, I don't want to be in, in, in the outside. I, I want to run with the crowd. Don't ever run with the crowd. Don't ever run with the crowd. Whenever we're talking about God's word, you need to run with the Lord. And if Saul had run with the Lord and obeyed the words of the Lord, he would have still been king over Israel. But I was afraid. I was afraid. Whenever we stand in God's word, we ought to never be afraid. Because remember, you and God, that's the majority. That's it. I want us to consider something, that partial obedience is disobedience in the sight of the Lord. The reason why I chose this topic of, of, of everything in the Old Testament is because you can find it from the very beginning of the Bible. 
And you can trace a line all the way down to the very end. And I'm not talking about the very end of the Old Testament. I'm talking about the very end of the Bible. Whenever we look at Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, notice what is said here. It says, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Did he not tell both of these young men the exact same thing? Did he not tell them exactly how to offer Yet, he respected Abel, but he did not respect Cain. And you remember the very next verse is Cain got angry, right? And then the Lord came to him and said, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fall? If you do well, if you do well, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Amen. And the implication is that God didn't accept Cain and his offering. Sin lies at the door, and its desires for you, but you shall rule over it. You see what we have here? Partial obedience. Well, Lord, I came to worship. I came just like my brother, and we both bought, brought something to offer up to you. But it wasn't in Cain to offer up what God had asked for. But I worshipped. I put forth efforts. No, it doesn't work that way. And when we come together, when we have a mind of partial obedience to come and worship God, God doesn't have to accept those offerings. God doesn't have to accept whatever we throw out to Him. God is not a dog who gets the scraps. God is God and He deserves the best of all things. The best of our glorying to Him and our singing to Him and our worshiping to Him. And He will only accept what He's asked for. And that's heartfelt worship right from God's Word in accordance into what He has expected of us. But I want us to consider something. I told you it goes from the very beginning all the way down to the very end, right? We can go all the way down to the book of Revelation. You can go to Revelation chapter 2. Actually, you can go into chapter 3 as well, but I'll stop at chapter 2. And notice as he is going through, and here's the Lord, and he's speaking to these congregations. And he says, I have this against you. Now, generally, whenever he would start off, he would start off with a praise about these congregations. You've done this. However, I have this against you. This is what you're not doing. And how many times did the Lord say, and if you don't turn, what did he say? I'm going to come and I'm going to remove your candlestick. Or I'm going to come and I'm going to fight against you. He's giving them an opportunity, but he is also telling them that partial obedience will not float. From the very beginning of the Bible to the very end, we have that string of stubbornness and I want to do things my way. Do you think it's alive and well in the world today? Amen. Amen. And it's up to us to take the, this book, God's Word, and to go back to the Bible and to show people that we can do it exactly the way in which God has shown to us. Remember in John chapter 14 and verse 15 it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Most of us have that memorized, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't, you can do whatever you want to, right? Basically. But if you love the Lord, keep my commandments. Now, let me ask you a deeply personal question. Do you love the Lord? How many really love the Lord? How many of you are excited about going to heaven? How many of you are looking forward to going there? Amen. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Teenagers aren't excited. I'm having a great time here now. But you know what? I want you to love the Lord now. I want you to love heaven now. I want you to think about heaven. I want you to sing about heaven. 
one of these days we're going to leave this place and we've got a place of glory by which to go to. But if you love me, truly love me, then keep my commandments. I want to be keep my commandments. Then I've got a place for you. Notice in 1 John chapter 2 and verses 3 and following it says, Now by this we know that we know him, that we know God, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And that's real. This is real stuff that we're talking about here. I want to be in Christ. I want to be in his body. I want to be where the saving grace is located. Amen. But I know that if I have a spirit of stubbornness about me, if I have a spirit of rebellion about me, then what do I do? What happens? We're just like we've seen as well. You have fallen from grace. I don't want that to happen to me. And folks, I don't want that to happen to you. I want to go to heaven. Amen. And I want you to go to heaven as well. I want every one of you to be there. I want to gather together, just like we gather together at Palmetto Bible Camp, and just have so many people that are up there, and to gather together and to fellowship and and just have a wonderful reunion. That's heaven to me. Now, lastly, in First John chapter five and verse three. First John chapter five and verse three, it says. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Has God asked you to do something that you cannot do? Whenever it comes to worship, has God asked you to do something that you cannot do? And that, the answer to that is no. He, he's given us the, man, the commands that all of us can do. Has God asked you something to do to be saved that you cannot do? No. Actually, to consider it is rather easy to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord, is it not? Mm -hmm. Rather easy. You have a Syrian officer who would go down to the Jordan River because of a spirit of stubbornness. And he says, has not the Arbana and the far, far cleaner waters than down at the Jordan River? And his assistant says, but if he asked you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? And he goes down into the water and he dips seven times and he comes up and his leprosy is gone. But you know what? When we go down into the water, what happens? It's not our leprosy that's gone, but our sins are taken away. <clears throat> and his commandments are not burdensome. He's not asking you to do anything that you can't do. And I encourage each and every one of us. And there may be times in our lives in which we may have a spirit of stubbornness that arises within us. I would encourage you greatly to stomp it out and to turn to the, God, to the Lord and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And whenever we have a spirit like that, folks, I'll see you in glory one of these days. I'll see you there. If you will, will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day in which you've given to us. We thank you so much for the beauty that is around us to understand that this is this a dim reflection of the glory to come. And, even more than that, we thank you for the fellowship in which we have here as Christians that gather together in the body of Christ. And Heavenly Father, help us to live in such a way in which we would have a mindset about us to glorify you and to be more concerned about your will than our will. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may be able to continually keep our eyes upon you so that we will not lose sight, so that we will always be upon the straight and narrow, knowing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses of our sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we can all live in such a way in which we will be with you forever in glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.